Welcome to the Apron Academy. This video is specially designed for the dietitian in training, also known as the RD to be. So in this video, we're going to be talking about magnesium. So magnesium is our second most abundant uh, mineral in cells. Uh, phosphorus is the first, but I don't want you to get confused with um, how calcium is the most abundant um, divalent cation in the body. Phosphorus is the second most abundant divalent cation in the body. Um, this is the most abundant in cells. So magnesium gets second place. Uh, phosphorus gets first place in that. So we find it in our fruits and vegetables, also in some seeds, brown rice, almonds. But without our fruits and vegetables, we actually are nowadays seeing um, cases of magnesium deficiency. And um, a big point being the quality of soil can affect this as well. But I do think with our Western diet and just the ease of running into a fast food restaurant and getting your uh, fried food um, we're lacking a lot of those fruits and vegetables that contain magnesium. So um, we eat magnesium and then it's absorbed into our body. So it's absorbed in the small intestines. Uh, the first, it, it has two absorption mechanisms. So the first is a passive paracellular diffusion pathway. So it's able to go right on through in between the cells, right on through into the blood. Uh, that's when we have a higher concentration of magnesium. Clodin here is helping us do that. So then our second absorption mechanism is through the transcellular pathway. So TRPM6 is uh, what we need help with in order to get it into the cell. Then it's able to be released, though I will say these mechanisms are not well known uh, and not well understood. But this occurs when we have a lower concentration of magnesium in our body. So my beautiful rendition of the kidney. Um, magnesium homeostasis is regulated by the kidney. 80% of magnesium is filtered through the glomerulus. So right here, also kind of the same thing. Um, so 95% of our magnesium is reabsorbed. So the major site of reabsorption is our ascending loop of Henle, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So passive diffusion, and it's the same um, absorption as above. It's when it's passive, it's regulated by Clodin. So here, because there's so much magnesium uh, running in here first, we have our Clodin that, that w helps us reabsorb the magnesium. It's also um, regulated by 125 OHD, so our activated form of vitamin D. So then this um, increases divalent cation excretion, and then any extra magnesium that isn't reabsorbed here but just keeps on going um, in the distal convoluted tubule right here, we have about 5 to 10% that is reabsorbed. But because it's a lower concentration, it's taken across via TRPM6. So the same transporter right there working so that, you know, at every turn you have um, a, a channel that allows for magnesium reabsorption. Um, so therefore, if we do have any mutations in these transporters, like a mutation in uh, the TRPM6, that can lead to hypomagnesemia and uh, hypocalcemia. So, and then that's why we absorb, reabsorb so much. We, we 
we reabsorb 95% of that. So what does it do when it gets there? I guess I'm going to stay here for a second. So our magnesium content, we have 50 to 60% of magnesium in our bone. That's kind of like a buffer reservoir. Um, extracellularly, our extracellular magnesium, we have about 1%. Um, primarily, it's free magnesium, but we also have uh, magnesium that's complex to anions. So like... Um, complexed with phosphate, magnesium phosphate, um, or it's bound to albumin. Intracellularly, mag, um, this is our majority of where our magnesium is. So uh, with a higher metabolic rate, we have a higher um, magnesium content. So in places like muscle, because there's a higher metabolic rate, you're going to have more magnesium there than you would in, say, your red blood cells or something. Um, we have them in the nucleus, mitochondria, ER, a cytosol. It's bound to proteins and negatively charged molecules. And then in the cytoplasm, 80% of magnesium is complexed with ATP. So this is how it, how ATP exists. It's kind of like... Uh, I'll write it in this corner. So ATP, you know, we see it written just as ATP, but in reality, it's actually always like this. Magnesium is always attached onto the ATP, and if it were not, ATP would be useless. And um, with any study of, like, science and biology, uh, we know that ATP does not need to be useless. We need that um, in our bodies. So talking a little bit more about our function, we have magnesium functioning as an enzyme and ATP cofactor. Talked a little bit about that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Um, it functions as a second messenger and then also functions with our calcium channels. Now, well, while I'm here, the primary function is that um, magnesium binds or chelates to negatively charged ions and it neutralizes the charge. Specifically, this works with ATP, um, but with enzymes, it is a cofactor for 300 plus enzymes. Um, as we continue to go on down... Um, with our calcium so it competes with calcium for a binding site and it magnesium can help modulate free calcium concentration but now let's just break it down let's go into each one of those so first of all um, this is magnesium functioning as an ATP cofactor it's helping to stabilize this negative charge of the ATP so that therefore it can um, ATP can be used. So this is its main biological role. Magnesium is an anion charge neutralizer. So if we have decreased magnesium, we'll have a decreased amount of energy or ATP that we're able to use. Um, by neutralizing the charge density on ATP and ADB, it allows for the binding of ATP and ADB to enzymes that use them as a substrate. So magnesium is very important in all reactions with ATP or ADP. Now, the second function is that second messenger uh, system. Again, this happens when it's bound to ATP, so kind of that's why that number one function is the main function. But uh, it does act as a second messenger. Um, it's a substrate for adenylate cyclase, um, where the ATP is the Mg ATP, that magnesium ATP, which helps regulate cell activity. So it works in our hormones and our neurotransmitters and magnesium works in the um, 
phosphoinocidal cycle, um, and it's needed for the hydroxylation of PIP2. So in order for this mechanism to function, we need PIP2, otherwise it would just stop here. Um, and in order to hydroxylate this, we need magnesium. And then thirdly, a function of magnesium is that it works um, with the calcium channels. So magnesium is known as nature's calcium channel blocker. So you see here that the magnesium is blocking this calcium channel, calcium is not able to get in. So this can help slow the inward flux of calcium via those calcium channels and block calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. So without magnesium, our intracellular calcium levels would increase, resulting in muscle cramps, hypertension, coronary and cerebral vasospasm. All right, but what happens if we don't have enough? Again, like what I just said, if we don't have it, we're going to have increased calcium because this is not going to be there, so calcium would just keep flowing in, and we'd have those muscle cramps, hypertension, coronary, and cerebral vasospasm. Um, and even if you weren't, like, eating a lot of magnesium, like if you're, um, or, well... This is because you're not eating a lot of magnesium or you do have impaired absorption that this is happening. So other things that could happen include hypokalemia, so our um, potassium levels. If we have decreased magnesium, we will have decreased potassium from our cell, which is needed for 70% of our daily energy. And our kidneys can't conserve, conserve potassium, so it's very important to... Uh, monitor our level of magnesium so that our potassium levels are where they need to be. With um, not enough magnesium, we also have hypocalcemia. So we have impaired parathyroid hormone because it requires ATP. It requires ATP, which also requires magnesium. Um, so if parathyroid hormone were low, but you just simply treat it with increased magnesium, it can cause that parathyroid hormone to be stimulated to be able to uh, work like it should again. We also have neuromuscular manifestations. So our um, calcium levels, we have muscle contractions, neuromuscular hyperexcitability. So we have tetany, muscle cramps. That's all because we don't have enough magnesium. We also have cardiovascular manifestations. So our ECG abnormalities and cardiovascular dysrhythmias, uh, also due to the potassium levels. But it's all connected. You can't just say, okay, great, magnesium is important, so I'll just eat that. Well, you need magnesium, you need your calcium, you need all of it. So there's not really a lab test to determine, um, you know, if you do have enough magnesium in your body. Um, it is regulated by our circadian rhythm and stress, also physical performance and acidosis. So there can be a little bit of toxicity with excess magnesium. Uh, most of the time it just presents as osmotic diarrhea and really the toxicity is only in renal failure patients. So as the dietitian, it's so important to encourage uh, an increased intake of fruit and vegetables because even additional risks include osteoporosis, cardiovascular diseases, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, type 2. Um, so, so important to have magnesium in our diet. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe and share this video with others. See you next time.